Hi, Ollie. This one's mine. Hey, Brian, just make sure it's still there because I just closed out of it. So back up. If I go like this, can you see that? Cool. Oh, yeah. That's helpful. <laughs> All right, cool. It's really weird. So. All right, so we're going to get started. Uh, that was an awkward pause because I was like, do you guys want me to introduce you? And then he didn't do it. So, and now he's just talking about tacos. All right, so I said this earlier, but my name's Kevin Mack, and this is Tim Bobberlo. And we're talking about acid template guides. This is something that both Tim and I have been working on for the past, uh, uh, am I on or off on this? Sorry, I turned myself off. Um, we've been working on this concept for the past two years. So Tim and I used to work together at an agency, and now we both work together again at Cardinal Solutions. And this is really aimed at creating an outline for designers and developers to work together and also to create beautiful imagery for the web. Uh, I want to say on Twitter, I'm nice transition, and Tim's something, but he hasn't even, he doesn't have a single tweet, so I just tweet at him, and he used to be the egg until yesterday, and I was like, that's embarrassing, so, uh, yeah. So the traditional outline slide, uh, there's gonna be four sections that we're talking about, and it's gonna really hit on a brief definition to kind of set that baseline. And then from there, we're going to go into problems. And the problems are really to outline and identify where we came up with asset template guides. And then Tim's going to really dive into the inspiration and the analogy of what asset template guides are and what kind of brought it all together. And then I'm going to go through a process of creating one of these asset template guides and how it relates to any project that you're working on. So an asset template guide, again, is something Tim and I created. And it's been something that we've been using on our projects to kind of make imagery better. And the short definition of it is, is crafting assets for the digital landscape. And it's inspired by traditional print. That may seem kind of confusing right now. But as we go through the examples, it should make sense. So just inspired from traditional print and trying to bring it to the digital landscape. And by digital landscape, I mean really focus on responsive. So from the small screens to the large screens and different contextual factors. So there are four problems that we're highlighting. There's probably a billion, but four that kind of align for today. The first one is the reflow of content. So as browsers get smaller and bigger, if you have a block of HTML text, the text is going to kind of stack and change as it goes smaller across a fluid stream. So uh, with imagery, a lot of times people just think in the responsive is, I just need to change the aspect ratio. I'm going to shrink this image down and then have my content here. And a lot of times what happens is you see a really beautiful mobile version of a responsive site, and you see a really nice desktop version. But then there's this horrible awkwardness between small screens and big screens. And the idea of a, a good responsive site is one that doesn't look responsive and looks like at no matter what screen resolution, what device you're on, it's appropriately designed for it. So this aims to kind of resolve that issue. The second one is the creative freedom of designers. So when responsive came around, um, it, it, it required more technology. And there were a lot of limitations to the design. Because people used to design to a certain width and be like, all right, I want to make this perfect at the desktop. It was similar to like the days when we did 800 by 600. Looking back a couple of years ago, it was just like, all right, I have like this nice canvas, and I know my pixels, and I'm going to design around it and make something really beautiful. But with responsive and the variable, and there's so many different conditions that are happening, it's very hard to design. So a lot of designers feel like they're handcuffed, or they don't know. And it gets into this like guess and check game when you're creating assets and imagery for the web. And asset template guides are really aimed at trying to give the creative freedom back to the designers while working with the uh, responsive landscape. So not seeing it as a limitation, but really seeing it as something that can enhance your design. The third one is the communication between designers and developers. And this has always been an issue in this industry. So how designers and how developers kind of work together. And uh, by using asset template guides, it bridges that gap and allows the experts kind of lead their own craft at the right time. The fourth one, and probably one of the most important ones to myself, and working as a consultant, also working in, the, in an agency world, 
what happens is you develop these really nice responsive solutions or really nice designs. Then they get incorporated into a content management system. They're handed off to the client. And then someone creates an asset and new imagery. And they do production on their side, at the client side. And then you go to the website when it launches and you're super excited. You're like, check out whatever.com that I just designed. And it looks like pure shit. And it's because the client maybe didn't know how you cut and design those images for the responsive landscape. And this is probably the biggest thing that comes out of Asset Template Guide. So just kind of bringing in the idea of how you're going to be designing and handing it off to the client and keeping consistent looks and look and feel. So Tim's going to talk about the inspiration of where Asset Template Guides came from. So we're looking to solve those problems that Kevin just outlined. Um, we were looking for some sort of platform or analogy as to how can we look at how we can solve a lot of these problems. Um, so we actually kind of looked back at, hey, how have people solved these problems in the past? And so print design actually had a pretty good example of what we could do to make these uh, updates uh, within our process. Um, so what we're showing here is a really simplified version of a print template. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, print design, but um, typically, any printer you deal with is going to give you some sort of print template to ensure that your intended design is going to live up to your expectations for the actual final piece. Um, so typically, some of the uh, major indications that they'll give you is a bleed, a trim line, a safety, a crop, and a fold. Um, so we'll show you how these work within the print uh, template and then how these same concepts actually work within the digital uh, example. So uh, looking at the initial bleed, Really what this is, is an indication for the designer for if they're trying to do a full screen image. So a lot of times if a printer is printing a specific piece, uh, they're not actually printing on a piece of paper that's the exact size that will end up, uh, the, the end user will end up seeing. They'll print on a piece of paper that's much larger. So to allow for a bleed or an image to go from edge to edge, what you'll do to compensate for the inconsistencies and unpreciseness of a, of a printer is to actually allow for additional space or additional imagery to go outside with the end, up, the end crop. Um, so this ensures that you're not gonna get any of the paper bleed through along the border. You're gonna get a lot closer to your design than what you're as to what you're looking for. Looking at the uh, next uh, line is the trim line. This is really an indication for the designer and this is what they're designing within. Um, so when you're actually looking at this piece, and wanting to design to it, this is what the designer is going to think of as, hey, ideally, this is the area that's defining the space that I'm designing for. Next is the safety. And this is probably the most key piece. So the safety is helping define the area uh, of all the content that's most important. So uh, you're hoping that the imagery or the most important part of your imagery is going to live within this area, as well as any content. So anything that lives outside of the safety area there is potential because of the impreciseness of uh, the print process that it could potentially get a little close, too close to the border. Um, it could potentially get cropped. Uh, so this allows you to uh, compensate for any of those inconsistencies. Next is the crop. And this is really a little bit more for the printer. It's kind of like the trim line for the printer. Um, so this is the area that's helping to find the actual cut edge of uh, said photo. Um, as you see, these are being treated a little bit different. They're actually tick marks, and the reason being is that uh, you don't want those to ever end up within the actual printed piece. Uh, so they pull that away from all the other uh, lines. And lastly is a fold. Um, and this one is a little bit more unique. Uh, within the printing process, there's a lot of unique processes that could happen. There may be a fold, there could be a die cut. Um, but similar to any of these other pieces or the, any of these other indications, um, you're not quite sure what's going to live within that area. So you want a little bit of extra fudge room uh, so that you're not getting any of their image to be cut off or any unexpected results through the printing process. So as we move forward, we'll see how these same lines and indications actually um, translate into that digital space. Just show of hands, who here has worked with print design? Awesome. So you guys are kind of good, familiar with the concept. Percentage. Yeah. Make the magic happen. All right, so what we're seeing here is an example of just an asset, just a single image. Uh, we don't have a background color. We don't have any of the content laid in. Uh, but this is what could be utilized for a section of a site. Um, when we've done asset template guides in the past, typically we'll do that for a specific section, not necessarily an entire page. Um, and that's just to make sure that typically if uh, 
website is being updated, a lot of times it's just by section, not an entire page. Uh, so we want to make sure that we're able to divide that up um, so that not only can you just update that single image, but also you can divvy it up between multiple designers or developers. So this is now showing what it will look like once some of that content is brought in. Um, if you move forward, we'll start looking at how these actual lines are uh, brought into the digital space. We still have the bleed, we still have the trim line, safety, crop, and fold, uh, only they're being used in a slightly different variation, but really keeping the same concept. So what we're seeing is how you could potentially use a bleed. Uh, and really why this is beneficial to the designer is, as Kevin was mentioning, um, with responsive, there was kind of a lot of backlash initially around people feeling that they had to design within squares, they had to design within with a very rigid grid. Um, so we wanted to try to look for a way that we could allow the designer to kind of break that mold um, and give them a little bit more flexibility with how they're using imagery. Uh, so we're using a bleed here so that hey, we have this area that could potentially bleed out. What we're seeing here is how it look on a larger desktop view. But as you'll see in a, an example that we're going to be showing you, how that area actually will flex uh, within different viewports. So here we're seeing the entire image. Uh, but as the uh, browser were to be scaled down, some of that's going to bleed off the side. So it gives you a little bit more freedom in regards to how some of that imagery is being utilized. The trim line is really just the overall browser window or the viewport size. Uh, but that's also important just so you can have a good idea as to uh, what's going to live inside and outside a browser at a specific resolution. And the safety, once again, is one of the more important pieces. So within uh, this particular image, we want to make sure that we identify what is that key piece that will be viewable and will not fall outside the viewport at no matter what resolution you're at. Uh, so this is probably uh, the most important piece of this asset template guide. The crop at this, uh, within the digital realm, is simply the uh, actual cut of the image or the slice of the image. So if you're doing the production, this is defining your actual image that you will then slice for the developer. And lastly, the fold. Um, and this is a little bit more of a stretch, but it's once again looking for uh, the opportunity to give the designer a little bit more flexibility around how they're designing. So similar to how we're treating the bleed, um, we want to actually be able to allow for something similar that will be able to be uh, layered behind some of that content. So once again, it allows the designer to have a little bit more flexibility with the visual interest of the imagery and how some of that content is layered on top of it. So really, uh, it's really apples to apples in regards to print versus digital. Um, and the concepts, for the most part, are one for one. Um, but we just want to make sure that uh, we're thinking about a lot of these opportunities with how we can allow for a little bit more flexibility within the uh, design process and, and for the designer to break outside that more templated grid mold. Um, and as we move forward, we'll see a little bit how this comes to life within the actual process. All right, the process of creating this. And it's going to be highlighting and kind of reviewing some of the stuff that Tim talked about and some of those, like, uh, pain points. So the first step, uh, there's actually six steps inside here. First five are about getting to reuse. The last one's all about reuse. Uh, the first one is you have a concept, and this is kind of led by a designer or a, the design team. The second is a sketch, and it's where the designer and developer are collaborating, working together. After that, the developer kind of goes, or the development team goes on their own, and they create the structures that are going to hold the actual assets and the content. From there, the team works together and, um, and refine what those structures actually look like and make sure that it aligns to what was intended for the content. From there, kind of break apart but still work in parallel at the same time where the designer creates production imagery and the developer really focuses on reuse and maybe modifications and modified versions of that individual structure. And then it's all targeted at reuse. Looking at the first step of the process, so this is the design concept. Uh, right now we're redesigning our portfolio at our work. So this is just, again, one section of the site. And this could be an introduction section or like some kind of call out. So here at the top we have this, our work, and it's kind of like a header subtitle. 
and then there's a logo, a little blurb about what this is, and then imagery that's supporting what the messaging is. So this is done in Photoshop. There's some other pieces that are called out here. It may be hard to see on the screen, but there's a glow around this image. There's some uh, background image and like little dots in here. But it's all about the designer and the design team really focusing on how we can be creative and portray the design in a way that uh, they want to. So trying to really push the limits on the design. From here, the designer developer or the dev team and creative team get together and they either print it off, they look at a screen, this is an example of like a print off, and the teams kind of work together and they mark it up. So here's an example of that uh, printed off and kind of drawn on. And we're talking about what's actually important. So the green is like, this needs to be shown no matter what. We know it's not going to look direct exactly like that initial concept, but we're going to be inspired by that PSD or that design to create the actual structure and what's going to live in the browser. Highlighting other pieces of this design and being like, that's not important. Uh, we don't need to see that at all viewports. If it's kind of cut off on an iPad, who cares? It's just kind of there for aesthetics. Other pieces to call out is this layering effect. So it's kind of dotted around, like imagining if this was a true asset because this is like a PNG that's transparent. So it, it doesn't have a hard edge and we kind of have to make an imaginary hard edge. Where I could have said like this image goes this full size and full size this way, horizontally, vertically, but that's a large image. So I still want to be conscious and aware of imagery and the sizes for it. So I'm like, ah, maybe we layer this text and it gives us some ability to have this nice layering effect. The same thing with at the top and the side. Also in that uh, step, the design and development team talk about kind of like, what do we want the mobile to look like? What do we want these in-between stages to look like? And you could do a mobile first strategy for this or a desktop first, but it's kind of nice when you're talking about a full-fledged design and having as much creative freedom. And a lot of designers still today work that way. And especially when you're trying to explore creative freedom, it's kind of nice to start with having the most amount of space. So in this next uh, step, this is the HTML structure. So this is a screenshot of my browser. And again, I'm highlighting the, the browser window in this uh, magenta pink color. So this is a screenshot of my browser and I've just identified it with some lines. This is gonna be a video. And then this is a two column structure and it's kind of outlined in this dotted. So you can see over here, there is one column, there's another column, and here's this image that's kind of like offset and highlighting this fold area in the gray where there's text because it's going outside the bounds, but the subheader is still on top of it. There's the kind of major block of content with this gray, which means like be conscious, make sure your contrast ratios are high, whatever image I'm doing, there's gonna be text here. Just be conscious that as I'm designing, don't put something like too, that's gonna compete with the design. And then the green is a visible area and the blue is gonna kind of get, is gonna get cut off at certain landscapes. Another thing that uh, we do and talk about is the difference between targeting really small devices and big devices inside a single asset template guide. So here we have this green and the solid color means it's on the desktop you're going to see it. And the outline, the thin outline, which this is green, it's kind of hard to see through here, but this green outline means that that's what's visible on mobile. And in this structure there's two main breakpoints as it goes through. But anything that's single line means that it's uh, mobile, targeted, and solid means desktop. And if there's a solid within a uh, line, that means it's everywhere. So as I play this, you'll see that the browser starts cutting off the blue on the right-hand side. And then eventually it's going to hit this right here, and the image is going to start scaling down. But if you pay attention over here, the text never goes inside the green, meaning that I have, the f I have full freedom to do whatever I want inside there. And then as I get smaller, that green is still visible, but it has that outline of the other green right here. And this will just play back through. So pay attention to the blue, the green, and also that fold area. Super rad. Moving on to the next step, this is where the team gets together and refines. So we bring in the initial asset that Tim designed in the concept, and we relate it to this asset template guide. This is also where if the development team or our initial sketch, we plan for something that didn't look right, 
because sometimes when you're making a structure like this that is flexible from small to big screens, and you throw in an image, you're like, oh, that just doesn't work right. The, no, the, this looks just as bad as before, and I just invested time on this. So you can make tweaks and uh, update the structure and make sure that it's aligning with the actual imagery that you want. So an example of that is maybe instead of it, uh, the blue going here, the blue goes all the way here, or the blue stops here, and it starts scaling. So here, as I go down, you see the wallet is not that important, and it starts getting cut off. But I still want to show the wallet at certain landscapes for that nice kind of off the bleed field for it. And then that image is my main image, which is the phone, and the messaging is related to it. So I want to make sure that's visible. From here, the design uh, and the development team, again, kind of go their own ways. So the, the designer is working on the production. They're adding inside that asset template guide, that green area, and looking at those fold areas and trying to add enhancements. So now we've introduced that, that initial glow, which if you're comparing this to the first concept, that glow went out a lot farther, but inside here it's been refined and been really targeted inside that asset template guide and make sure that it looks seamless inside here. We've also introduced that background image, which is the repeating little dot here and there, and then really move this to align from small screens to big screens. At the same time, this is where the development team uh, starts looking at this structure for reuse and refactoring it. Not changing how it's gonna be from small screens to big screens, but really looking at how I can reuse this in other sections from a code standpoint, so HTML and CSS. So as we go down, you'll see that this image starts cutting off, which is, should be familiar from the last one, but You'll notice as you're paying attention, it looks like every single pixel that this image was designed for it. And that's what this is really targeting at. So no matter what my screen dimension is or what size I am, this should look like an image that was designed for that uh, aspect ratio or that viewport. And then this is where that breakpoint happens, and it goes back up. <clears throat> so this is another thing that we've also introduced while putting this together, is you can use Photoshop, you can use Sketch and, and the objects in Sketch and smart objects in Photoshop to recreate what those HTML structures look like in Photoshop. So after that structure is completed, it's really easy for me to take some basic screenshots and align what the uh, text is going to look like inside of Photoshop, and then align my asset template guides to how it's actually being produced. So from here, I have a smart object, and I have an iPhone size, an iPad size, and a desktop size. If I go inside here, I can open up that smart object and kind of place an image inside here, and edit it the way that I want to, and then see exactly how it's going to render inside the browser. And I can start exploring how this is going to render in an HTML structure just in Photoshop. Also inside here, this is where I can be playing with the background colors and also different layering effects. So this is really targeting at giving the freedom to the designer to make sure that they're creating these beautiful sections of a site. Do I have to hit it one more time? Okay, the process, so this is uh, from one to six, really targeting that reuse. Uh, there was an article that came out, I think just last week, Jason Grigsby put it out. So if you guys don't know who Jason Grigsby is, he's kind of one of the leaders from like a UX, UI perspective uh, in the web world. And he's been one of the people that's led uh, use cases for responsive images. So I know I was a part of the responsive images community. I don't know if Luke was also a part of that here, but a handful of people got together and said, we're gonna create responsive images. For those that don't know, it's using media queries inside of images to switch them out. Uh, and you could use responsive images in combination with asset template guides if you want to, but this is kind of to aim at looking at the responsive landscape and doing imagery correctly. 
So in my use cases for the responsive image, images, as well as Jason Grigsby, majority of the time, there isn't a use case for the responsive images. And this actually aligns a lot better. And in the examples that Jason gave in his article that came out last week, it was still about this guess and check work between designer and developers. And then eventually you get to a point and you're like, ah, let's just switch out the image. And that's kind of what responsive images do. So you can still use them in combination if optimization is one of your pieces that you're concerned about. But this is aimed at that reuse, that team communication, and building a reusable structure for the responsive landscape. And it is completely targeted around the way that Tim and I have worked together. And it's really about this idea of letting the experts lead their craft and to collaborate and work together. So as teams work, and it also brings in the client, and having this open dialogue, and really letting people excel at what they do, what they do really, really well, without those restric restrictions or handcuffs to prevent them from doing their best job. All right, so the code that I show in that demo, I've actually put it on my code pen, and you can get to it by going to atg.nicetransition.com. In addition, we've also put the Photoshop uh, document of that asset template guide out there. And uh, if it's kind of unclear, again, Tim mentioned this, and I kind of talked about these are reusable structures. You could reuse that if you wanted to, but it's supposed to be you create a structure for the content that's out there. And this is just one example of an, of an asset template guide. It's probably a more advanced one, so you can have a more simplified one with like image layering, or even just how an image gets cut off on the side. So. Uh, check out atg.nicetransition.com, and we'll also put this presentation up on there. And you can always reach out to us through meetup.com and also through my Twitter handle, Nice Transition. And any questions? Yes. yes. And remember to repeat the question. <laughs> Sure. Um, it's always going to be unique for each client, and this isn't going to work for all clients, of course. Like you never know what their production team's like and what that overall group's like. Um, but the hope is that there will be some sort of handoff between you and their team um, and some sort of communication doc that will help highlight this. So ideally, what you'll be doing is handing off these PSDs and having that communication or some sort of meeting uh, with their developer, development team, the front-end development team, as well as their design team or the production team as to how the, this overall works. So you know, having a, some sort of talk like this or just a meeting like this that explains what this concept is and how uh, there's a PSD is for each one of these pieces. Um, and typically, we try to uh, not have a gazillion different uh, templates for a site. We try to do as much reuse as possible, knowing that updating can be such a huge issue uh, moving forward. So any time that we can take this initial concept and reuse it just by potentially like flipping where the content is versus the photo or realigning a lot of these elements um, so that you have kind of an overall theme, uh, but there's a lot of variations within that theme. Um, that gives them the ability to only have a small section of these PSDs that they have to work with that will then hopefully work within a series of templates within their site. Um, so yes, there's a learning curve, but it's really that handoff of, hey, here's a series of PSDs. Use these to hopefully update your content. Hopefully you have documentation as to character limits, uh, size restrictions, all that kind of stuff. But similarly to how we look at it initially designing is we want to give them a little bit of freedom of how they can uh, update a lot of their content so they're not so restricted to, um, hey, you only have this little photo, this square <laughs> or rectangle photo to update moving forward. Yeah, and I think part of the process that we definitely do more on the consultant side is educate our clients throughout. 
and especially when it comes to something like this in a marketing site that is responsive, it's these concepts can be difficult, and that's why we you know came up with this because we struggled to communicate this to clients, and we definitely even struggled to communicate this with our peers at the agency because they're just like, why can't I just do whatever image size I want? Why can't can't you just update the code? And the development of the code, they're, they're imagining like I'm gonna create an, an image and then the code is made and it's gonna align to my image, which isn't efficient at all. Um, and with these, and Tim's also working on another example, which I don't know what it's gonna be, but I think it has a banana in it. Just to kind of show the difference, like it's the same template, it's the same asset template guy, it's the same structure. But putting them next to each other, you would never know that's the same code or it is the exact same template. So that freedom, the flexibility, allows you to have unique sections of your site with 100% reuse, with just changing out some colors in the image itself. Oh, and just to add to that, like your initial question, uh, when I was at Startup Weekend last weekend, I, yeah, I, I was talking to someone about it and I was able to explain it within two minutes. So this concept's really easy to explain. Uh, we took maybe 20 some minutes to explain it, but that's just because we not we want to make sure that the analogy is clear. But it's really it's a pretty simple thing to explain to someone, uh, especially if they have a print background, which a lot of designers, uh, at least today, still have. Any additional questions? Ben? So repeating the question for Brian, uh, is the asset template guide an additional service or something else that we uh, create in the process? I would say yes, and yes, what? yes, it is an additional piece, and it is additional handoff, and the overall process may seem like it takes more time, uh, but in reality, what we've outlined, that process of one through six, is how developers, designers, and teams should be working on creating interfaces. But in reality, that's not how majority of teams work. And this kind of bridges that gap again, but that, that template is something that you should hand off if you want your site to look, to work. Um, and the, if, it may take some additional time in that beginning step, but again, that's something that we should have always been doing. And this will reduce that maintenance nightmare and hiccups in future uh, steps of the process. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. I think just the only idea there is that if you know you're designing to this, it's not that big of a additional work for the designer. Um, there is that little bit of more collaboration piece where you're taking those screen grabs and producing this asset, but really, if you want to be able to hand a lot of these uh, PSDs or templates off to a uh, client and allow them to be updating things moving forward, that should potentially be something you're doing anyway, so this is just a more high fidelity version of that. Yeah, I think the thing that took us the longest for this presentation was trying to define the trim line and the crop line for uh, traditional print. They're actually really hard to define. Yeah. Well, cool. <laughs> we know what they are, we're just like, how do you put that in a simple, digestible way? Yeah. So Additional questions? Relatively quick. Yeah. Um, so make even modified versions of it are really, really easy to do. If I wanted to do the reverse of this, I could do it in a couple lines of code. And so the, when you, if you check out the code on, our, on the code pen, um, you could make the modified version probably within a couple minutes. And then you would just need to reverse that asset template guide. And then there's also variations on the height. So it does have like a minimum height and that's how that, that, you know, that scaling effect happens in between. So you can easily and quickly make modifications to it. You can make the image shorter, you can make it taller, you can also push it off. So in that example, it's negative 200 pixels. You can make it negative 400 pixels to allow more layering on top of it. One of the ideas that we also played with was 
um, or have played with is instead of having content that is text content, but having two asset template guides that kind of layer and play together, play nicely together. So you can actually do that too. So instead of it being that block of copy, just put another image and let those two kind of go against each other. And I would love to see an example of someone doing that. Um, we couldn't think of anything besides like a forest or like a beach, but that's, that's not really that cool. Does that answer your question? Well, let me add on to that too. Once you hand this stuff off to a client or it's built into a CMS or whatever, um, all bets are kind of off. So at that point, you can give them all the tools they need to keep the site um, beautiful and you know aesthetic and up to date. But what they do with it after that point is kind of you know you you don't have any control over that. But what this does do is it gives them all those base elements that should be everything that they need to design all day long. So outside of the fact that we're giving them or trying to restrict, uh, say, character length and whatnot, which is hopefully defined, um, like one of the big things we try to always push for is defining content before we even uh, look at uh, some of the design pieces. Um, we, have, we give them the ability to add background images. And if we have that, then they could add two background images. So they have some flexibility there. We give them the ability to add the main uh, graphic that we're talking about, a content zone, a header zone, and a subhead zone, which is really the, all the main pieces that we're talking about that a user would potentially have. This design actually does have some additional pieces. So there's some iconography that goes with it to help um, tied to the fact that there's different teams working on it, there's a CTA that goes into it, but we felt like that started convoluting uh, some of the talk, so we felt like by moving, removing that stuff, it made the concept a little bit more simplified. Um, but really, we're giving them everything that they would need to move forward and, and update this any way they want. There's even potential where their brand could change, and this should be e able to be easily updated through CSS so that it can then reflect that brand change. Um, so hopefully we're empowering them enough that if their team is creative or wants to be creative or they want to you know, push limits, we are giving them the tools to do that. But once we hand them these tools, who knows what's going to happen. Yeah. And something Tim talked about, it's like giving them the ability and these modified versions. I feel like the more options you give the client in modified versions, the weirder and misunderstood they can become. So. We were even having a discussion today about restricting some of those options, and if they ask for it, we can turn them on or let them know that they exist. But when you're especially using a content management system, giving them too many options makes it confusing. So eliminating it, and then if they ever need to enhance it or add it at a later time, it's kind of like more of like a turn on. Um, and it's a turn on for them, so I'll leave it at that. You're going to for sure ask for <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, speaking of content management, how are you guys kind of integrating that to what you guys are doing as far as content management? It goes back to, and I, I kind of, in this, is why, why it's kind of hard to put this together, because I really want us to like deep dive into some of the process that we do and creating interfaces and designs. Um, one of the other pieces is the back end or the integrator piece. And everything with the structures and the interface that you're building should be first, uh, for first and most importantly, based around the limitations and or the capabilities of the platform or system that you're working in. So if the system doesn't allow for a lot of flexibility, if it in, in, injects a bunch of DOM wrappers and a bunch of like crap, you need to just make sure you're aware of it and then still be able to work around those restrictions to make something beautiful. Um, but you're, you're somewhat handcuffed. And that's where the design development team really, really need to work together. And there may be like a, like a zero step, which is that limit, I mean, looking at the limitations of it before we explore anything. Yeah, using the, the template. The one piece or the second part of the process, which was that sketch, um, that's kind of the point where the first, the first step is really trying to allow the designer to um, go the sky's the limit with their design. But it's that second step where the developer potentially reels them in but at the same time trying to be creative is how can we make this design live within the restrictions that we're dealing with. Um, so depending on uh, the different personality types, you know, that can end up in, in all sorts of ways, but hopefully within that step of the process, uh, you're able to identify a lot of those limitations uh, within the CMS, make sure you identify them, and then make sure you're designing and keeping that in mind as you're making those refinements. Cool, anything else? You mentioned 
performance aspect. I think it looks like you built art direction across a single image over a lot of landscapes. But you know, at some point, you're going to have to address performance if you get this huge 1200 pixel image. You know, it, it's beautiful across all these. Yeah. But at some point, you know, you're talking on, on a mobile device, and you're downloading an asset that's for sure. five times its yeah. necessary size. How, how do you? Yeah, for sure. Uh, and different, depending on how you go about it, you could use responsive images to switch out to a smaller image. But it's more about having alternative ver versions of that image. So that image is scaled really big at the desktop and it is a large size. But it could be the same aspect ratio and very tiny. And why I bring that up is as it gets smaller, you could get to the point where I don't need that huge image and I just need to replace it with a different image. And depending on what you use on your back end or some more sophisticated setups, you can do imaging that same way and replace it as long as it's the same uh, aspect ratio, it should it should work perfectly. And different content management systems do that out of the box. I usually turn that off because I don't like how they render them. And if you do all your image uh, like optimization on your computer, you have a little bit more freedom to make sure that you reduce it. There's different articles out there. It's like the pre-optimized two times versus the optimized. And it's like, this image is a quarter of the size, but it's three times bigger than it. It's like, how does that work? It's because I took the time to optimize it. There's a bunch of different ways around it, though. Anything else? Cool. All right. All right. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank, thank you. you for talking. <laughs>